If you're a poor negotiator, you're going to spend a fortune. If you're a good negotiator, you'll save a fortune. And if you're a great negotiator, hopefully you'll make a fortune. You see, success in life depends upon your ability to influence. And I've recently had my ninth book published, Negotiate, Influence and Persuade. And in today's podcast, Mark Reed and I have a chat and I'm going to share some tips from my book. Now, if you think about it, life is one long negotiation. Either you're buying what somebody else is telling you or selling you, or they're buying what you're saying. And you negotiate all day in your life, whether it's with your spouse, your children, your work colleagues, your customers, your clients. So our chat today isn't just for you if you're in sales or if you're a real estate negotiator. You're going to get some tips, some rules, some suggestions from our show today so that you become a better influencer, more persuasive and an effective negotiator. So welcome to today's episode of the Michael Yardney podcast. Welcome to the Michael Yardney podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. All of life is a negotiation, so the question is, are you good at it? Hi, I'm Mark Creed, and in today's episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast, we'll discuss how to become a successful negotiator with your regular host of the show, Michael Yardney, who just had his ninth book published, Negotiate, Influence, Persuade. So who better to learn how to become a better negotiator from than the person who's been involved in billions of dollars worth of negotiations and has even written a book on it. So welcome, Michael. Thank you, Mark. It's interesting to be on the other side of the microphone this time. It, it is a bit of a change of events for us, isn't it? Mm. Well, I, I loved reading your book, uh, and not just because you wrote it, because it was a really valuable book, I thought. But let's start at the very beginning. Michael, why is negotiating important? Well, whether you realise it or not, whether you're in business or just in life in general, you're always negotiating. So if you're a poor negotiator, you're going to spend a fortune. If you're a good negotiator, you'll save a fortune. And if you're a great negotiator, you'll hopefully make a fortune. So in my mind, negotiation is a critical skill for investors, for business people, for entrepreneurs. But as I started writing this book, my publisher asked me to write it. I realized to be successful in life, you need to No, more than just negotiating techniques. You need to be able to communicate with people. And in today's world, in different ways maybe than you had to before, more digitally, you needed to learn how to create rapport. You needed to understand how to ethically influence and persuade people. So the book that started off a book on negotiation ended up being uh, Negotiation, Influence and Persuade. So, Michael, great answer and a great book, as I said. But the thing is that the book... It's more than just a book on negotiation, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So because as I started to say, life's one negotiation after another at home, at work, with the family, with customers. And in every transaction, if you think about it, there's a buyer and a seller. Either you buy what they're selling or saying to you, or they buy what you're suggesting or offering. So this book isn't just for salespeople. It's for consumers, because we all negotiate every day of our life. It's not just for business people. While it'll be useful for people in business, it'll be how to negotiate with your spouse, your children, your work colleagues, your customers, your clients. So in my mind, understanding the principles of negotiation, the principles of influence, how to persuade people will help the readers of my book get the best deal every time, whether they're buying or selling, whatever side of the equation they're on, Mark. Yeah, Michael, as I was reading your book, I could see how it could apply to such a a, a broad base as well. So as you say, not just business, but even just in your family life, I could could see me, you know, having negotiated and influenced and persuaded children over time. Michael, I know that it takes a long time to write a book. What made you write a book on how to negotiate, influence and persuade? Well, the purpose of my book was to teach others how to get what they want, how to get other people to do what you want them to do, but not forcefully, with your ability to interact, to communicate, negotiate, influence, persuade, because that's going to determine your level of income. Uh, It's going to be one of the most important 
determinants of your income. So I wanted to teach readers the skills to, so they can get what they want, when they want, while still retaining good relationships with friends, with co-workers, with customers, not to be pushy. But Mark, it actually is worth going back a bit because before I wrote the book years and years ago, I was a sucker for persuasive salespeople. Now, that was the days before the internet, and I used to buy things from great salespeople, from direct marketers. They sent compelling letters, some long you know, direct mail letters. Now, it's actually worse for people today who don't understand the principles I share in my book because they're bombarded. I'm bombarded. You are continuously with persuasive marketing, even more today because of the power of the internet and email. And I came to recognize that in Western cultures, the average person knows very little about negotiation. In fact, negotiating skills, I don't know, they don't seem to come naturally in our Western culture. In fact, what does come naturally in most negotiating situations is probably the worst thing that you can do when it comes to negotiating. You end up being shark bait. And this is particularly the case in the world of real estate that I'm involved in, where your emotions play a big part. But it's not just about property. Think about it. All of us at some point have been under the influence of a great negotiator. I don't know. Have you ever experienced market time when you were, you were moved to act? You were compelled to do something, to buy something that you, you were so prepared you'd almost do anything to get it. And when you think about that, I thought, why? Why are you compelled to? Why? How have they managed to get us to overcome our fear? How has it they managed to take action. And I wanted to learn how to bottle that kind of power. What would happen if I could harness that, the ability to persuade others to move through their hesitancies, to act on one's suggestions? And that's what I learned. And because I asked myself the question, what would that power, what would that power to persuade, to influence be worth to me? So in the 80s, I went about studying the best, the best of the best. And I learned principles of persuasion and influence from the master, Professor Robert Cialdini. I learned sales techniques from Brian Tracy. I learned negotiating techniques from Herb Cohen. But boy, the world's changed since I first studied those concepts, I don't know, close to 40 years ago. Back then, Mark, the paradigm was trust others until they gave you a reason to do otherwise. Today, the sales process has been turned on its head and it's based much more on people needing a reason to trust you first. You've got to spend time getting to know your prospect, your customers, their wants, their needs, their fears, their desires. So in my mind, to become a power negotiator, you need to understand human psychology, human nature. Boy, this is a long-winded answer to tell you that my book has sections on NLP, on body language, on, on how to understand how the mind works, Mark. Yeah, Michael, I think that's one of the things I really loved about your book is that um, you know when I read it, I realised that it was it was so different from from other books that I've read on this topic. And you're right; I mean, the, the world has changed, the way we do things has changed, and that's what I like about about your book is that it sort of brought all those those ideas and updated them. Michael, a lot of the books and blogs that I've read on negotiation sort of teach that the, the trick, if you like, or the secret to negotiation is, is to meet the other person halfway or that it's all about the give and take and finding the happy middle. But that's actually not what you advocate, is it? No, and let's be honest, we don't always want that. We don't always want to meet halfway, do we? So if you want to work away with the best deal, you're going to have to learn how to persuade others. You're going to have to learn how to give a teeny bit so the other party comes across to your point of view. For you to get what you want, you're going to have to somehow or other cause other people to do what you want. But don't get me wrong, you still need to do the right thing by people. So in my mind, the difference between manipulation and persuasion is intent. So I don't teach hard sales techniques in this book, even though some readers, I guess, could use some of the techniques to manipulate other people, but that's not my intention, and I actually hope it's not that of the readers. So if your intent is to sell something, it could be your product, your service, your professional service to somebody, if you want to sell something that they don't want, they don't need, they don't desire, or worse, something that won't produce the outcome they want, well, then you're a con artist, and that's not who this book's for. However, if your intention is to help someone get the results they want, then I believe you should use every tool of persuasion, negotiation, and influence to close that sale, Mark. Yeah, Michael, I mean, one of the things that I liked when I was reading that was just the, the concept of making sure they're using these skills in, a, in an ethical way, and, and that's, that's a, a constant theme throughout the book. A, a big thing that I really liked was you've got 27, 27 rules of negotiation. We haven't got time to go through all 27, and that would be a real spoiler for anybody who is looking to read the book as well. But maybe you could just share two or three with us. 
Well, I guess the first one to understand is that everything is negotiable. That doesn't mean you're always going to get what you want. It doesn't mean you're always going to win in every negotiation. I mean, you and I are business partners. You know, we don't always win. But you must remember that everything is at least potentially up for negotiation. And this means that there's no such thing as a fair price. If you think about it, every price was set by somebody which means it could be changed by somebody else. And so nowadays, um, when you go into shops, there is room for negotiation, not just with real estate, but things that you may think are not negotiable. So I've learned years ago, if I go into a clothing shop and I ask uh, for either a discount or something special, they'll always throw in something else. They may not discount the price. So the corollary to this is that a fair price is simply what one person's willing to pay for a service, a product, and this will wildly differ between different people. Depends upon their level of interest. Uh, depends what's on the table. In other words, nothing is non-negotiable, even when the other party tells you it is. Uh, while you may not be able to negotiate on price, as I said, they may not discount the price. They may throw something else in. Okay, the other rule maybe we should talk about is you should know what you want before negotiating. Always know that bottom line, the highest you're going to pay or the lowest you're going to accept if you're a seller before commencing negotiation. It's a bit like planning your holiday. First, you decide the destination, where you want to end up, then work backwards and decide how best to get there. So in negotiation and in life, if you don't have a plan of your own, you're going to fall into somebody else's plan. Now, clearly, it depends how big the negotiation is. If you're talking about buying an ice cream, you know, you, you're not going to start negotiating on price. Uh, but if it's a bigger deal, Know what you want. And maybe the third trick you asked me for three, the third rule is treat negotiation as a game. When it comes to negotiation, you've got to be involved, but not too much, because if you're too emotionally involved, you're going to lose your perspective. Uh, emotions take over, and that doesn't really work too well. So like all games, there are rules. A skilled negotiator knows the rules. He knows the structure of negotiation, and I outline them in great detail in my book, Negotiate, Influence, Persuade. Uh, Michael, three three great rules, and it's amazing to think there's another 24 on top of that 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 people will get in your book. Michael, it's often said that you should never be the one that makes the first offer in a negotiation. Now, something I don't agree with. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you hear that all the time, don't you? But the answer is that it leaves something called anchoring, contrary to common wisdom. People who make the first offer usually have the upper hand. It's owned by it's something that psychologists call, as I said, anchoring. It's one of those cognitive biases we have. In salary negotiations, for example, whoever makes the first offer establishes the range, the possible variation uh, f f from that anchor. In uh, real estate, an estate agent will set an expectation of what the vendor wants, and that figure will always still come back or or prior to an auction where you don't really know where it's going to end up the auctioneer will often say well houses like this in this vicinity have sold around eight hundred thousand dollars he didn't say this one will but that figures in your mind when you're talking about it so the first person to put a figure on the table has got power mark it's an it's a very interesting approach and it's one of the many interesting approaches in in this book Michael, when I've read negotiating books in the past, you know, one of the things I often read is uh, if you're looking to find an agreement on price, um, then what you should do is split the difference. But is that really negotiating? Well, yeah, they say, I mean, let's say you want to buy something at $75 and, and they start at $100, you start at 50 and you think you're going to end up in the middle. It tends not always to work that way. And so what I would be doing is starting with uh, – a figure well below where you want to end up in your negotiation, and then the increments should get smaller and smaller each time you make another step towards the final result. And the other thing is people sometimes get so nervous that they make a second concession straight away as well. And so the, it doesn't come to splitting the difference and ending up in the middle. They seem to give away more. So you should never give anything until the other party gives something as well. So I don't always agree with splitting the difference, but you should know where you want to end up. You should understand what your highest acceptable price is if you're going to buy, as I said, or the lowest figure you're prepared to sell at. And work towards getting a bit better than that. 
Michael, you talk in your book about the importance of preparation for a negotiation. In fact, the book actually takes the reader through a process for that preparation. In negotiation, how important is preparation? Well, if we talk about important negotiations, negotiations involving lots of money uh, or ones that take a long period of time, uh, then it's important to prepare and understand, as I've said a couple of times, knowing what you're going to be prepared to pay or how much you're prepared to accept. Understanding the other party is also important. So part of the negotiation isn't just about money, but who you're dealing with, how they negotiate, what your real objectives are, what their objectives are, what are they really after, what are they trying to achieve, knowing what you would also do if the negotiation fails, in my mind, is an important preparation because you don't always get what you want out of a negotiation. Sometimes you have to learn to walk away. So having a second option, another option, another plan is helpful as well. That's all part of the preparation process, Mark. That makes sense, Michael. I think that uh, the other thing that, that sort of resonated with me with the book is that it's not just about learning how to negotiate in the heat of the moment, you know, at the coal face of the process, but you talk, of, for example, a lot about the importance of, of building rapport. Can we just talk for a moment about how important it is to build rapport as a part of the negotiating process? Yes, as I mentioned, a portion of the book is based on the NLP, Neuro Linguistic programming that I learned about understanding how one communicates. And interestingly, 95% of persuasion occurs at a subconscious level. We like dealing with people who are like us. We like dealing with people who we trust. And skilled negotiators understand the, the tremendous impact of this, that we're more likely to comply with a request made by people we like. Interestingly, people we like tend to be people like us, if you think about it. So negotiators understand the importance of building rapport, which is a sense of sameness. Most people find it easy to relate, build rapport with people who like themselves, and they find it hard to build rapport to like people who are different. That's just unfortunately human nature. So an influential persuader understands the importance of building rapport, which is creating a level of sameness as the first step in any serious negotiation. And then rapport increases the sameness between you and the other person, minimizes the difference. Uh, as I said, there's a whole science to it called neurolinguistics programming. It's a topic of a different or other books, but I go into it a bit, including things like body language, how to make people feel more comfortable with you. I think um, one of the things that the sort of the, that I liked a lot in this was the fact that you mentioned in the book, Michael, that there's a way you can get somebody to like you within the first 10 seconds of meeting you. So tell me, do you have to get all of those things right? Or does, does that concept work if you just, if you miss a few and you, you get, say, the majority of them? Well, it's that old concept of never judge a book by its cover, but we do. We tend to create impressions very quickly, and today it could be over the internet, over Zoom or things like that as well. So it's even more important today when you aren't right in front of a person physically. So the more of the little tips I'm going to give you now that you can introduce the better. So one of the first ones to create this instant rapport, uh, to, to get people to like you, to get people to judge you favourably, is go in with the right attitude. I know some people go into a negotiation and to a discussion with preconceived ideas. Sometimes they've got negative feelings. Maybe it's not even to do with a negotiation, but something that happened at home or with your boss or at work or you're frustrated. I know at times I've gone into meetings assuming things about a prospect which is wrong. So number one, adjust your attitude. Number two, smile. Be happy. The smile on your face shows, uh, your eyes light up, your mouth changes shape. Look people in the eye. That's the other thing. People like being, people having uh, interest in them. And use their name. Call them by name. Talk to them by name. Mark, these are old principles that go way back to uh, that book from Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Nothing's changed over a century. Uh, shake hands if you can. It makes a connection. Raise your eyebrows. Look curious. Pay attention. Lean in towards the other person. You can do that even on the internet over Zoom. Look interested. 
use open body language with welcome gestures, your hands out, and nod if you're paying attention while you're watching them either in real life, face-to-face, or over the internet with way a lot of con- communication is happening nowadays. So you can attract people quickly by paying attention to them and doing these little tricks. And Michael, in the book you refer to there being sort of seven tricks and you know initially ask the question, do you have to get all of them right? But when you lay them out like that, they're actually not that difficult. They're not that complicated, are they? They're, they're sort of fairly simple tricks that you could, you could put into place fairly quickly and easily. Sure. It's all about the fact that a large part of communication isn't the words you use. It's intonation to a degree, but a lot of it is body language where there's a whole science to that. And I know in a recent podcast, I interviewed Alan Peace, who's the Mr. Body Language, and his message uh, I know has resonated with you and me over the years. And it's still applicable today in this world of Zoom meetings, isn't it, Mark? Oh, very much so. And you would think that perhaps, you know, with face-to-face meetings being a little bit off the boil at the moment, but in Zoom meetings, you can body language is still vitally important. Hey, you, you speak about the idea of trusting your gut, you know, trusting your instinct. I found that fascinating because there's a lot of a, a school of thought out there that giving you reasons as to why you shouldn't, why you shouldn't trust your gut or why you shouldn't deal in instinct. Well, That only is applicable once you become a skilled negotiator. So as I think I said a moment ago, most of the way people in Western countries negotiate is it's not instinctive. And if you actually act what comes natural, you're shark bait for a good negotiator. But a brilliant negotiator puts all the theories that I put in my book into practice and then falls back onto the instinct. They learn how to read subtle signs the other person's giving out. They know when to push a deal, when to pull back, when to change tack. This kind of instinct can be honed, but it actually takes many years of practice, and eventually it becomes second nature. It becomes natural. So you only do that once you've learned these techniques, Mark. I remember when I first learned about this concept of negotiation and that there was an art to it, a science to it, it was actually very foreign to me. I just thought I knew how to do things. And that was a long, long time ago, taught to me by a good friend of mine who uh, was a smart business person and was in the 80s. And I I was just, uh, my eyes were opened when I learned the science behind it. And if I would have trusted my gut then, and I did, I was taken advantage of by good salespeople. Today, all these things that I've just done naturally over the years, um, they're they're second instinct. Michael, you've spoken a couple of times about the the risk of becoming shark bait, and I love the term, um, at the hands of of somebody else. But there are ways in which you can, in fact, almost become shark bait at your own hands through bias. And in the book you talk about, I think it was like 10, 10 different types of bias. And I have to admit there's even a couple of, types of bias that I wasn't aware of. Maybe you could share with us, uh, say, the most common, maybe three of the most common types of bias that people might bring to a negotiation. Well, Mark, I think you talk about this concept of cognitive biases, which is our brain's way of sneakily convincing us to make decisions that aren't always in our best interest. And I see this in the world of real estate, and I know you see this in the world of business. These biases convince us to spend more, save less, feel more confident. Uh, Maybe we shouldn't be. The scary thing is, for most part, we're powerless against them because we never question them. We're not aware of them most of the time. These cognitive biases, but they're basically shortcuts that our brain has learned to take because we're confronted with thousands of decisions every day. We couldn't make them if we had to think through them all. So the world's complicated, and if we had to make a perfect decision every time, we'd just be so bogged down. So our brains learned these shortcuts. But if you want to become a better negotiator, you're going to have to understand how the mind works, yours and the prospect's mind. And again, it's not manipulation if your intention is good. So one of the biases, and we discussed that a little bit a minute ago, was this concept of anchoring bias. Anchoring is the tendency to give too much weight to the first number put on the table in any deal. It's a tendency to have mental anchors, reference points, and we talked about that with who makes the first offer. Look, I remember a number of 
probably last year now, because I don't think I've been into the city of Melbourne this year at all. I went to a morning breakfast and I was amazed what the sign on the car park said, how much it would cost to park. And the first one I drove past said $10. And I think it was for half an hour or something like that, you know, how expensive Melbourne car parking is. And the second sign I saw was $6 an hour. So I thought, hey, this is good. The first number acted as an anchor and impacted how I saw the second figure. Mark, when I got in the car park, that was for the first 15 minutes and then it was $20 an hour or something afterwards. I was in there for an hour and it cost me $75 or something silly. But it's, it's this concept of the first number that's put to you. Property marketers, estate agents, car salespeople, they use this principle all the time. You know, they start with a high asking price, they make you feel good, and then you get it because you get a discount from them and you think, hey, I've done well. That's because the initial price that they mentioned for a house, for the car, whatever deal, that hugely influences you. Whether we like it or not, it keeps our mind referring back to it. So the principle isn't only restricted to money. It can be about quality. You know, estate agents will sometimes take you to three inferior properties and then they take you to the last one, Mark, and boy, that's a good one. I'm going to take that one. I bet you've heard of that before. That's how I bought my first house, Michael, in fact. And if you'd taken me to that property first, I probably would never have bought it, but... Interesting, isn't it? The next bias, cognitive bias, is one called sunk cost fallacy. That's uh, the sunk cost that has already been incurred and can't be recovered. Of course, these costs shouldn't be considered when making financial decisions. If you've already been done them, you've paid them. But when they're considered, the decision maker falls victim to this sunk cost. The problem is once you've invested time or money in an idea, future decisions are more influenced by what we've already done, more, more than what's maybe in front of us. So it can get in the way of investment decisions. Um, it, I've seen that with investments where your properties turned out to be a dud or share investments lose value. And many investors hold on to worthless shares or underperforming property much longer than they should have, losing money in the process rather than changing the strategy because they feel they've, they've put too much into it. Mark, we also see this in people who, after a prolonged negotiation, they sort of they think they must follow through. I mean, wasted or invested so much time, effort and emotion in, they think that uh, I better continue on. Michael, I mean, I, I love the concept of the bias. As I said, there were some things in there that, that I didn't even uh, – I didn't even – I wasn't aware of, so it was that was a great chapter to read. You I've got one more then, if you like, because you asked me for three. Yeah. And the third one is, I guess, what's called the bandwagon bias. This is the phenomenon that people um, do things primarily because other people do them, sometimes called herd mentality. So herding is the phenomenon by which animals, and I guess humans to a degree, herd. They stick together as a mechanism to enhance their safety. Now, look, this could have made sense when we were cavemen roaming the plains. You know, staying in the herd meant that you were protected by being eaten from a saber-toothed tiger, but it doesn't necessarily make sense today. But we see that in, I don't know, in strong property markets where the media stories hype things up and a property boom's created. That's why it's important with financial matters in particular that the herd is usually wrong. Most property investors never end up getting a big portfolio. So remember, just because everyone else is doing something, it doesn't mean you should follow the crowd, but it's a really good example of how our brain works to protect us. I guess, unfortunately, excellence is the exception rather than the rule. So remember Warren Buffett's rule, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. Uh, that's always that's always a good rule to hang on to. You, you map out uh, the principles of negotiation, and I actually think that's that was just, if all I got out of that book was just that one chapter, I would have been absolutely delighted. But at the end of that chapter, you say this, you say, remember, life is one big negotiation. What did you mean by that? Well, well many people think negotiation is a set of activities. It's not really what it's about. We negotiate in subtle ways every day. Sometimes it's obvious the best car deal, but it could be less obvious. Yeah, well, what's the best table at the restaurant? I want the one with the front seat, the window, look outside. <laughs> or back home, who's going to take out the rubbish tonight? Or what are we going to watch on TV tonight? So life is one big bargaining event. And if you become a good negotiator, it does make a difference to the quality of your life, Mark. That's what I was getting at. Michael, in those principles, you say that one of the principles is that the person with the greater power will get the better deal. And you make the comment in the book that that's such an important principle that you, you devote an entire chapter uh, to the 14 sources of power in negotiation. 
Can you give me maybe, again, three three that you could share with us that sort of are the main powers that you see used or three that's going to mind? I think most people don't recognise the source of power, but when they're in a negotiation, they actually feel it. Sometimes you feel you're in control and sometimes you feel uncomfortable or you're not in control. Sometimes you feel you've got the upper hand and sometimes you feel intimidated. And, of course, like most things in life, these feelings of power are really a perception. If you think you've got it, then you've got it. And if you think you don't have it, you don't have it, even if you really have got the power. So, Mark, the truth is there are many types of power negotiation. And the first one, a pretty obvious one, I think, is time power. Either having the time or the lack of it, that's an incredible source of negotiating power. So understanding how time can give you power can put you at an advantage. Often a deadline will be set in negotiations, but remember, these deadlines are usually arbitrarily set, and therefore they can be flexible, they can be extended. Um, When you're feeling trapped by somebody else's time power, understand the deadlines can be changed. Uh, Conversely, you can use them with power uh, to empower you when you're having negotiations. I mean, auctioneers are real estate agents are masters of this when they've got an auction and it's all got to be organised over a particular time. But very often they'll come back to you and say, well, you've got to make an offer by 6pm tomorrow night because I've got two other people making an offer. Nowadays we see that on the internet a bit, don't we, Mark, where there's a ticking clock going down telling you uh, that uh, you know, in 24 hours the price is going to go up. So time power is important. The other important sense of power is information power. In negotiation, the more information you have, generally the more power you possess. Knowing more than the other person that you're negotiating with is very powerful. So I guess that goes back to one of your first points about the preparation. But get ready, be prepared, do your homework, know more than they do. Now, just because you know more doesn't mean you should show off and say that you know more because being a know-it-all doesn't work well in negotiation. In fact, I love answering questions, and I know you share this with a lot of people in your mastermind also. You'd like to know the answers to the questions before you ask them. Never be be careful asking a question you don't know the answer to, Mark. Yeah, 100%. Um, Yes, we both. That's that's a practice I think we both follow. That's nice. But, Michael, number three. Well, the third power is alternative options power. The more options, I guess, you've got, the more power you possess. And that makes sense. So head into any negotiation with a number of available options because if you don't, uh, then you actually lack very little power and you're going to lose the negotiation. I think one of the points that you make when you're talking about information power is also one of the principles when you say you you can't wing it. You can wing it for so long, but nothing, you know, say nothing will outsmart old-fashioned research. And at some stage, if you winging it and you don't have that information power, you're bound to come unstuck. Mm. Hey, mate, you, you're, you're well known uh, and, and widely regarded as the number one property expert in Australia. So I suppose some people could be listening to this and they'd be thinking, uh, here's just another real estate book by Michael Yardney. The fascinating thing that I found is that we got to, goodness me, page 261, about three quarters of the way through the book, before you really started applying the principles to real estate. So this isn't another real estate book, is it? No, it's not. So there's a couple of chapters about how to use the principles for real estate. There's what I think a great chapter about how estate agents use this for auctions, but I think it can be extrapolated to other areas as well. There are plenty of books about real estate out there, including some by me. There are lots of books for salespeople out there. I wrote this book not just for salespeople, as I said at the beginning, but for consumers, because we all negotiate every day uh, with our boss, with our children, with our colleagues, with our customers, with our clients. Um, And so there's also lots of books on sales techniques and negotiating techniques. I wanted to make this different because it explains the fundamentals. I, I wanted to explain the psychology behind why the techniques work and then teach people how to use them effectively. So it's much more than a book about negotiation. It's about persuasion, about influence, and more importantly, how to wield those two important traits to meet your goals. I hope that anyone who buys it, reads it, will change the way they do business, how they interact with their friends, their family, and it'll give them a greater understanding of why other people behave the way they do, and how to motivate them ethically, fairly, correctly to take actions that are going to help other people, Mark. Yeah, I think that's that's the really nice theme that I got, got in the book. Michael, um, we've spoken in this discussion about some of the rules to negotiate, some of the science to influence, some of the tools to persuade. If you could leave us with one final tip before we wrap up, what would it be? 
I guess it depends upon where you come from and your culture. So a lot of people who are listening to this are going to be people who've come from uh, Eastern cultures where negotiating is a part of life. And a lot of Westerners or Australians, people from other cultures, they actually find it uncomfortable and unusual. So I think it's important to understand where the other party comes from and how they behave. In the book, there's a chapter about the different personality styles. So even people in uh, who come from just purely Western cultures negotiate differently. Analytical people will negotiate differently to outgoing social people will negotiate differently to people who are more direct in their way of doing things. So really, it's an important study of people, behaviour, human interactions. And I think by understanding this, I know I have more fun in life. I know I have more control of my life in all sorts of areas. So get to understand human nature, human behaviour, and you're going to get the best out of life. You're going to get what you deserve out of life. Michael, as as I've said, I've read the book. Um, What we've discussed today is really just such a small portion of the vast amount of information. But even though there's a lot of information in in there, the thing I really like about it is that it's easy to read. It's it's simple to follow. There's lots of information that you can apply really quickly. So there's lots of tools in there that you can use instantly to start to get better skilled at negotiating, influencing and persuading. How can our listeners find out more? Well, go to the website negotiateinfluencepersuade.com.au, Negotiate Influence Persuade, and you'll be able to get a copy of the book. You can get it on Amazon. You can get a Kindle version or a hard copy version. And when you do, there's actually a number of bonuses when you register the book to get even more information, Mark. Oh, well, do yourself a favour and make sure you follow that advice. And great book, Michael, as always, mate, a great opportunity to chat with you. Thank you, Mark. I had fun. Well, I hope you got some benefit from my chat with Mark Creedon. And if you now want to learn a bit more about how to be a great negotiator, how to get the best deal every time, whether you're buying or selling, whether you want to be a more influential persuader, go to negotiateinfluencepersuade.com and get a copy of the book, which if you do, I'll autograph personally for you. And you can get it, of course, through Amazon in the Kindle format, but I can't autograph that one, can I? By the way, if you got some benefit from this, please tell somebody else about the Michael Yardy podcast as well, because I'd like to make more people successful in life, and being a good negotiator and influencer persuader is a great way to do things. I'm really proud of this book. It's already been picked up by two overseas publishers as well in foreign languages, so I'm looking forward to spreading the word to lots of people. In the meantime, you can spread the word by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to this podcast as well. Look forward to catching up with you again real soon. But in between, you can be in contact with me on social media. Just look for Michael Yardney and I'll see you when my next show comes out twice a week. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing, and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?